Well, good morning again, New Covenant. Here, we'll try it again. There we go. Good morning again, New Covenant. Good morning. Good morning. So we played a guessing game with cities last week. This week, it's an object. It's the most powerful weapon in the universe. One of the greatest gifts that we've ever been given by God. It can take the most prideful person and bring them to their knees, or it could take the most humble and despairing person and rise them to the heights. Anybody want to take a guess at what it is? You're holding it in your hands this morning. It is the Word of God. It's what we get to dive into together this morning. At the very beginning of Ephesians chapter 1, Paul launches into this prayer uh, for the church in Ephesus, and this is really going to be his second prayer for the church in Ephesus. Good thing for us to be praying for together as a body of Christ that not only the church in Ephesus would have lived this out in around 65 AD, but we would be living it out here in 2022 AD uh, right here in Albuquerque, New Mexico. So great prayer that is coming from the hands of the Apostle Paul. Um, he's really echoing Psalm chapter 95, verse 6. Many of you will know it as soon as I start to read it, but O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our God, our Maker. So you're about to see this morning that Paul is about to get on his knees, and he goes again from chapter 1 with this prayer for enlightenment for the church in Ephesus to now a prayer for enablement, that we would get off our duff and go watch the Lord do amazing things through his church. He says he wants to work through you with explosive power. Uh, one of the things that I would say to all of us as believers is we do not need to use terms like, I'm just killing time. I just want to make it through another day. I just want to survive the week so I can get to the weekend. I don't see that for believers. As believers in Christ, we have the living God of the universe taking up residence inside us via his Holy Spirit. And he says, I want to do amazing, explosive things through you. And the more we come to know Jesus, which think about our mission statement, to know Jesus and to make him known, the more we come to know Jesus, the more we will begin to realize just what it is that has been placed within us. So I don't care who you are, elementary age student, junior higher, uh, high schooler, college age student, young family with new babies, whether you are a middle-aged person, a senior adult, and you're getting to the end of life, doesn't matter where you're at on that road that I just mentioned, God wants to work through you and in you in mighty and explosive ways. No more saying, I just want to make it through the day. Don't make it through the day. Scripture has not called us to survive. Scripture has called us to thrive because of who Jesus is. And there are a whole lot of people running around Albuquerque, about 563,000 of them, According to statistics like Lifeway and Barna polls, there's about 9% of the population that knows Jesus. So again, if I'm doing the math right, we have over a, a half a million people in our city that don't know Jesus. They don't know why they are frantically racing up and down Paseo del Norte every day. They just don't know why they're doing it. There's a guy named Dr. Viktor Frankl. Uh, he wrote a book called The Doctor and the Soul, and in it, I found this kind of interesting. He said, in any city, Sunday is the saddest day of the week. It's on Sunday that the tempo of the working week is suspended and the poverty of meaning of everyday life is exposed. The emphasis on a fast tempo in the personal life is reminiscent of the clinical picture of unproductive mania. He says the yield of all the to-do is zero. We get the impression that these people who know no goal in life are running the course of life at the highest possible speed so that they won't notice the aimlessness of it. They are at the same time trying to run away from themselves, but in vain. On Sunday, when the frantic pace pauses for 24 hours, all the aimlessness, meaninglessness, and the emptiness of their existence rises up before them once more. What a stark contrast to what life is supposed to be like for us as believers when we come together on Sunday. Maybe some of you are still wondering, why do we gather together every Sunday? Why do we sing these songs and then listen to the pastor do his song and dance and then we leave? Well, ultimately, because it's a small taste of what we're going to do together forever in heaven. We're going to come together and singing is not something that human beings made up. The Lord did. In fact, it's interesting that even in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, much of what you read in there on the days of creation were put to song so that they would remember it. 
All 150 psalms are songs. Many of the Proverbs that you read about were put to song. When Jesus was born, Mary sang a song. In the book of Revelation, you know what we see over and over again? Songs. So we will be singing. The cool thing is when we get to heaven, some of us will actually sound decent. (laughs) Because I do not. You don't want to be by me while we're singing. But we should be singing songs and, and making melody to the Lord in our hearts. The Bible even talks about singing psalms and, and, and hymns and spiritual songs to one another. Please don't start singing at each other. That'd just be weird. But really what it's saying is that there are ways that we should be communicating the things of who God is to one another on a consistent basis. You've probably heard before, well, unbelievers need to hear the gospel Did you know that believers need to hear the gospel too? Yes, we know the gospel, but what is the gospel? Remember, the gospel is pretty simple. There's a God in heaven who created us. He created us to be in a love relationship with him. We messed that up completely. We destroyed it, and we were headed to sin, hell, and death. However, God loved us so much that he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to pay that penalty, and now we can walk with him, be with him, talk with him because of what Jesus did on our behalf. And we need to speak that into each other's lives consistently. We need to be reminded of how much we've been forgiven. We need to remind each other of how much we've been loved, and we need to remind each other of just how big of a purpose God has given us. Okay, so we are going to take a look at Paul's prayer for just that, that the church in Ephesus would realize what God has called them to. He has called them to a mighty task, and that is go turn the world upside down. Don't just show up on a Sunday, go through your thing, and then leave, and then hope to survive to the weekend. Praise God when you wake up on Monday morning. I know that just sounds weird, but it's Monday morning. Wake up tomorrow morning and praise God for Monday morning. You got to wake up. What a blessing that is. You get to take in another breath. You get to tell somebody about Jesus. Yeah, but I got to go to work. But you have a job. How, what a blessing that is. Many of you have a car that you will be able to get in and drive to work in. Praise the Lord for that. The fact that you get to take a breath, the fact that you might be up early, but you get to see a sunrise, or you might get to see a sunset. What a mighty miracle we get to experience day in and day out just with seeing what's happening with the earth spinning on its axis. That in and of itself is pretty darn amazing, and we should praise the Lord for that. Well, Paul is about to launch into prayer that the church in Ephesus would realize just what it is that has been placed within them and just how blessed they really are. Would you stand with me as we honor the Lord Jesus and we read Ephesians chapter 3? It's verses 13 through 31. You may be thinking, I'm weird. Why are we starting at verse 13? Shouldn't that have been the end of last week's passage? Actually, no. When we're taking a look at it in its original writings, it really, the next literary unit of thought should have been in verse 13, where Paul says this, so I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. For this reason, so for the reasons that the church in Ephesus are seeing Paul's suffering, And they're struggling, going, wait a minute, this man is a man of God. Why is he suffering? Why is he struggling? I don't know if you all have noticed, but in our sin-stained world, have you noticed that people that love Jesus oftentimes struggle and suffer even more than that heinous dude that lives next door to you that deserves to be squashed like a bug? Have you ever thought that before? Man, if you knew my neighbor or you knew that guy that lived down the street or that guy I worked with, why is this guy or this gal that loves Jesus, why are they getting stricken with cancer? Why do they lose a loved one? Why are they struggling so much with the loss of a job? This doesn't seem fair. I'm not going to try to answer that question for you today because I don't know the answers to all that. What I do know is that God uses a chisel oftentimes to make us more like Jesus, and that's what he was doing with Paul while Paul is underneath house arrest. And the church in Ephesus is going, why Paul? This man of God, why Paul? And Paul says, don't worry about it. He's going to use this suffering for his own glory and for our good. So he says, for this reason, verse 14, I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus 
throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. And can the church resound amen? amen? Go ahead and you can have a seat. Well, again, one big thing that Paul wants to make sure that we get ingrained in our minds, I believe, from studying this passage, and it's simply this. Let's be praying constantly, over and over again, that God would be strengthening and growing our inner self so that Christ can dwell deeply in our lives. We are going to unpack that a whole bunch this morning. And what we are going to be taking a look at this morning is what is the path to experiencing the power of Christ within us? Paul actually gives us five stepping stones on this path that we're going to walk down together this morning. We're going to take a look at what it means to be strengthened, that inner self being strengthened so that Christ can dwell deeply in our lives. I'm going to work backwards just a little bit. Let's start at verses 20 and 21 of Ephesians chapter 3. Would you look there with me? Because this is the chief aim of Paul's prayer here. This is the one big thing he wants us to get. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. Now listen to what he says. To Him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. What's Paul's chief aim in getting them to understand why he wants Christ to dwell deeply in their lives? So that God will be glorified. That is the main purpose in you being created by God Almighty. That is the main reason God made you. We don't think about that. Human beings don't think about that very often. The main reason that I was made is so that God would be lifted up, He would be glorified. Why did God make people in His image in Genesis 1 and 2? So that He would be glorified, so that He would be reflected everywhere we went. Sin enters the world and we do anything but glorify God. We become completely self-absorbed. Just by nature, we gravitate towards self Look out for number one. Think about commercials that you've watched. It's all about us being taken care of. Look out for number one. Get what you can get. It's a dog-eat-dog world, right? So take care of the number one dog. And Jesus comes on the scene and teaches something completely different. He says, ultimately, you, number one dog, are going to be dead before you know it. So why don't you actually do things that matter into eternity? Take care of that inner self. Grow that inner self. Allow that inner self to become more and more like the Lord Jesus. But then that begs a question. How do I become more and more like the Lord Jesus? Well, let's go back to the beginning of this passage in Ephesians 3, 13 through 15. And what we're going to do is we're going to start taking the steps. We're going to look at those five stepping stones to get to verses 20 and 21. How do I get to a point where God is glorified in my life in everything that I think, say, and do? This is probably a rhetorical question. You'll feel like you have to answer yes because the pastor's asking. But do you want God to be glorified in everything in your life? Do you want him to be glorified in your speech? Do you want him to be glorified in your thoughts? Do you want him to be glorified in your actions? Because that's where it starts. If you really don't care, then not much of what we're going to talk about this morning really matters. If you really do want Jesus to be honored and glorified above all things, then this morning is going to be a way for us to get there so that God is glorified, so that Jesus is honored. So go back to verse 13. Paul says, I ask you not to lose heart over what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. So Paul says, don't worry, even the bad things that happen to you, even that chiseling that God is doing, he's doing it for your good, for God's glory and for your good. So he says, for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and earth is named. This is not a part of your notes, but Paul says the very first thing that we need to do if we want God to be glorified is get on our knees constantly. I used to tell my church in Washington this all the time and the church that we planted out in San Diego, one of the things I mentioned over and over again was if you're physically able to do it, have your knees hit the floor first before your feet every day when you wake up because if your feet are the first thing that hit the floor, what are you doing? What am I going to eat for breakfast? What clothes am I going to put on my body? How, how quick do I have to get out the door to make it to work on time? What am I going to do when I get to work? What emails do I have to answer? What texts do I have to answer? Who do I have to meet with today? What am I going to have for lunch? All those things pop into your head. Instead, let's make our knees be the first thing that hits the floor. Then as we've noted, our 
entire series is identity and action. And Paul hits on identity in verse 15. He says, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. That word family should actually be translated fatherhood. He says, I want every fatherhood, I want you to realize that every fatherhood in heaven and on earth is named by the Lord Jesus. Here's where he's going with that. When a man and a woman get married, the woman does what? She takes on the man's last name. So my wife went from being Jolene Gibson to being Jolene Deshop. She took my name. She took my last name because we are together as one. Here, Paul is saying that we need to recognize that every person that knows the Lord Jesus Christ now has the same name. We are no longer just Dave or Joe or Betty or Sue. We are all now children of God. John chapter 1 verse 12 says, For those that received him, for those that believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. Not everybody is a child of God. It's only those that have trusted and accepted the Lord Jesus Christ. There is this teaching out there, this universalism, that everybody is basically going to go to heaven because mankind is good. Scripture teaches quite the opposite. In fact, Jesus comes on the scene and he says, your father is the devil. Oh, go say that to people and make a lot of friends. That is not a good church growth strategy. But Jesus wasn't a church growth strategist. He was about growing the kingdom. And we need to be about the same thing. Now, don't get me wrong. That might grow our church. People are going to come and know Jesus. People are going to get plugged in. New covenant is going to grow. But new covenant cannot just be about getting butts in seats. We need to be about getting butts in heaven. That's what we need to look forward. Can we say that out loud in church? We want to get get people into heaven, not just a new covenant church. Now, if they come and they get plugged in here and they grow, praise the Lord. Okay, let's take a look at the first stepping stone. You all ready? Here we go. I know some of y'all are note takers, so I'm going to try to go slow enough so that you can get some stuff written down. But first stepping stone is in verse 16. It says, according to the riches of his glory, he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his spirit in your inner being. It's one that we've been hitting on, but the first step on that path to experiencing the power of Christ is the strengthening of the inner man. Paul says that I want you to recognize the riches of his glory. This is the power, the dunameo, that Paul is speaking of, that explosive power that he wants you to recognize in your life. Now, there's three very practical places that we have to start if we want the inner man to be strengthened. Here's the first practical place that we have to start with, and I'm going to liken it to doing a workout. It starts with a healthy diet. You have to have a healthy diet. There's got to be a regular feeding on God's Word, and then there's also got to be an avoidance of junk food. Some of you all will begin to get the analogy as I unpack this. Let's start with the regular feeding on good spiritual food. Psalm 119, verses 9 through 11, come from the hands of a man who did a really good job of blowing it and not keeping a pure heart. His name was King David. And he says, how can a young man keep his way pure? By guarding it according to your heart, or by guarding it according to your word, with my whole heart I seek you. Let me not wander from your commandments. I have stored up your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. David is speaking of intaking the word of God and then storing that up on a consistent basis. Again, just between you and the Lord, but what does your time with him look like? Are you regularly feeding on the word of God? Are you storing that up in your heart so that when things take place in your life that are a little bit difficult, instead of gravitating toward worldly ways, you gravitate towards the things of God? Here's the avoidance of junk food. It comes from 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 11. He says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh which wage war against your soul. There's a lot out there that's waging war against your soul. There are a lot of different ideas and philosophies that are fighting for your attention. And Peter said, be careful, avoid those. And then David said, yeah, and then fill your life up with these things, the things of the Word of God. So we need a healthy diet, big time. But secondly, we need times of rest. Did you get rest this week? I mean, just time with Jesus, getting away from everything. If we don't get times away from the hurries of life, we are going to get snappy, 
we are going to get stressed out. We're going to get burned out. And believe it or not, but God's Word has the edge on even the dangers of physical stress. It will mess your body up. You will not sleep well. You will begin to get sick more. Your immune system will get affected. Go figure that God's Word had the say on, on times of rest. Listen, God created the earth in six days, and on the seventh, He did what? He rested. And now He set up a pattern for the rest of us. Get rest. Take a full day where you don't do anything but just focus on the Lord. Focus on your family. Matthew chapter 14, verse 13 says, Now when Jesus heard this, He withdrew from there in a boat to a desolate place by Himself, but when the crowds heard it, they followed him on foot from the towns. Well, I need to give you some context. Just prior to Matthew 14, Jesus has gone through some intense ministry. He healed a man with a withered hand. He taught all kinds of parables. And then right after that, John the Baptist gets beheaded. So Jesus got, went through some pretty major things physically. Intense teaching. Intense ministry. Went around healing a bunch of people spent a lot of time with them. Did you know that you can only connect with so many people before you begin to get tired and burned out? And we live in a fairly large city where you're constantly connecting with people, and that's not a bad thing, but you also need to disconnect every once in a while. Sometimes we have to learn to say no to certain things so that we can just sit back and focus on the Lord. Jesus is God in flesh. So he's kind of a notch above us, and yet he still said, well, I'm going to show you what it means to slow down and just rest a little bit. But then after your rest, there should be plenty of exercise. See, we tend to fall in one of two camps. We either go, 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 we burn ourselves out and go to the grave early, or we got a generation that is picking lazy and doesn't want to do anything. I'm learning that because we live in Albuquerque, the land of manana. Somebody just told me this morning, by the way, manana doesn't even mean tomorrow. It just means sometime in the future. I might get to it. <laughs> Maybe. Listen, there's got to be plenty of exercise in our lives as well. A good, healthy diet, times of rest, but then let's get out and use what we know instead of just absorbing and eating. Because let's just say that you have a fairly decent diet, but you don't do a thing. You're just completely sedentary. What's going to happen? going to need to hit the gym a little bit together, something like that, you know? So get out and get plenty of exercise. But right now I'm speaking spiritually. There's got to be an application in our lives of what we know from the Word of God. Let's go out and apply it. I love what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2. I would encourage you at some point, jot this down, but Philippians chapter 2 verses 12 through 13, he says, therefore my beloved as you have always obeyed, so now, not only as in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to work his good pleasure. Let's be super clear on something real quick. This is not a working for your salvation. Many cults have taken this verse and have quoted it at me before and maybe quoted it at you. See, it says right here, you've got to work out your own salvation. Work out, not work for Paul is saying that I want you to let out what has already been placed within you. Think of the idea of letting out a caged lion. Jesus is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Let him out to do his thing. He was placed within you at the moment of your salvation. So again, you're not working for anything. You're allowing the outworking of your salvation to begin to play out in your life. Let your speech reflect who it is that's living inside of you. That's Jesus. Let your actions reflect who's living inside of you. That is Jesus. Let your thought life reflect the one that is living within you. That is Jesus. So just to wrap up that point, we got to strengthen the inner man by feasting on the Word of God daily. If you do not yet have a plan for how you're going to feast on the Word of God, would you let me know? Would you let one of the elders know? Um, we're going to start putting out, I, I've developed a plan for reading through the Word. It's not dated, so that way if you get two or three days behind, you don't have to freak out and go, I'm never going to catch up because I can't read nine chapters in one day. Great, don't. 
Just pick back up on the next day. It'll literally just say day one, day two. If you miss a few days, you keep going. In the side margin, there are some books that I recommend that will help you to unpack what you're reading even more as you go throughout the year. I am super excited about that kind of stuff because it's going to get us in the Word. We're going to be in the Word together as brothers and sisters in Christ, as families. You're going to have some, some extras by servants of the Lord Jesus that are going to help you grow in your walk with the Lord. So I, I hope and I pray that you are excited about being in God's Word. Again, I will tell you that there is nothing in God's Word that is boring. If you're picking up the Bible and you're going, this is boring, then I think we're reading the wrong book because this is exciting stuff. Okay, I'm going to move us on. Look at verse 17, and look how Paul starts verse 17. He says, after recognizing the power that has been placed within you by His Spirit, that your inner being is being strengthened, he says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts. Let me stop there for just a moment. The words so that in the Greek are what's called a hina or a hina clause. A hina clause is literally like a cause and effect. Like if you do this, this will happen. So Paul is saying if you do this, this is what should take place next. Listen to what he says. He says, if you recognize the power that's been placed within you in your inner being and it gets strengthened, it says, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith that you being rooted and grounded in love. Hena clause, so that, cause and effect, Christ is going to dwell in your hearts. Now, now listen to this. He's, he's writing to believers. He's not talking about salvation. Christ is in you, but he says, I want Christ to dwell in you. Literally, to feel like he is at home. We need to allow Christ to dwell in our life through faith. Okay, we're going to get all technical and fancy. You ready? The word dwell is kat oikeo, which is kind of a fun word. Oikeo literally means to live in a house, to tabernacle somewhere, to move in. Kata means deep down or inside. So he's, he's using this really strong verbiage where he's saying, Christ doesn't want to just be in your house. He wants to feel like he is at home. Let me try to give you an example. Have you ever been somewhere, you're dwelling there, but you don't really feel like you're at home? Like you check into a hotel. It's a place to stay. You're there. You're in the room, but it's not home. Do any of you all have like a pillow that you just have to use, otherwise you just don't sleep as good? Okay, I'm just hoping I'm not the only weird one in the room, but I like to bring my pillow with me. I need my memory foam pillow. Those pillows in the hotel, they kill me. I wake up like, oh, my back and my neck are dying. I must be getting old. I need my pillow. Jesus comes into your life, and the question is, does he feel like he's at home when he's there? In other words, if we are engaged in all kinds of smut and evil... Jesus doesn't leave us. Hebrews chapter 13 tells us as clear as can be, I will never leave you nor forsake you. But the question is, does he feel like he's at home? Is he dwelling deep down? There was a guy named Robert Munger. Some of you all may have read his book, but it's called My Heart, Christ's Home. If you have never read that, I would encourage you, get your hands on Robert Munger's book, My Heart, Christ's Home. And he begins to unpack the different rooms in a house. And he starts with the library. He says the library is like the control center for the mind. Would Jesus be okay with what he sees in your library? What it is that you allow your eyes to look at, what you allow your ears to listen to. Then he moves on to the dining room. That's the place where our appetites and our desires are satiated. What are you feeding on? Would it be a meal that Christ would be okay joining you at? Then he moves on to the living room, and he says, this is where our relationships are cultivated, both with Jesus and with others. Who do you spend your time with? And what do you spend your time doing? He moves on to the bedroom, and he said, this is the place where you go to experience rest and comfort. What is it that you turn to to find peace, to find rest, to find comfort? He moves on to the workshop. And he says it's in the workshop where legacies are created and investments are made, and they're either trivial or they're eternal. But then here's the last one. There's that closet that oftentimes we try to hide some secret sin in. And Jesus says, I want all of it. I want the closet door opened, and I want to clean that out so that I can have the whole house. 
Jesus wants to renovate the whole thing. And when he does, that will help us move on to stepping stone number three. And that is living and comprehending the love of Christ. I, I want us, Paul wants us, Jesus wants us to live and to comprehend the love of Christ. It's in the rest of verse 17. So he says, I want Christ to be able to dwell in your hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and the length and the height and the depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Paul uses two metaphors here. One is rooted, like a well-rooted plant. He wants our roots to go down deep so that when these crazy storms like last night roll in, the plant doesn't get ripped up because it's got deep roots. I know I don't have to tell you this, but the storms are coming. We've already had some. Okay, I know we all keep talking about COVID. 2019, 2020 were tough, COVID. That's just the beginning. And I'm not saying this to depress you. I'm not saying this to be a doomsday prophet. That's just the beginning. That is just the initial steps of what the enemy is going to use to try to get us all messed up. Listen, we got really messed up from COVID. Many of our churches shut down and really for quite some time. I'm not going to get into this, and I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad or, or any of that stuff, but our church in Washington shut down for four weeks, and it was four weeks too long. We were told we could not open back up. I had to look at our leadership and say, gang, I do not find any if clauses in the Bible where it says gather together and worship if there's no pandemic. Gather together and worship if there's no terrorists threatening to kill you if you open your Bible. It just says get together and worship. So one of the things that I am hoping and I would be praying that we would do here is if we get told we have to shut down for any reason whatsoever, we just go back to the Word of God and the Word of God tells us gather, worship, praise Him, worship Him, do it together. Those that want to come, fantastic, but I will be held accountable to everything that I do as a man of Jesus, and as a man of Jesus, I'm going to be here, I'm going to worship Jesus, because that's what we're supposed to do together. So if we choose to join together, that's great. Again, that's not meant to make people feel bad. I'm, I'm not trying to start some kind of political rally because this is not about politics. This is about the Word of God. Now, believe it or not, there are a whole lot of things that politics speak to that the Word of God speaks to, and we'll just keep speaking to those things even if people say we shouldn't because they're political. Well, they're in the Word of God, so we just keep coming back to them. Let's just take a look at what the Word of God says. Now, the Word of God also tells us that we need to be grounded. That's speaking of a building with a firm foundation. There are a lot of foundations that people are building their lives on that are crumbling all around them. And I know this is going to sound really weird, but I'm going to say that's a good thing, that people see those foundations crumbling because now we can come and present the Lord Jesus to them, which is a foundation that will never falter. It will never crumble. So build your life on that. And Paul says, just so you understand this foundation, just so you understand these roots, I want to unpack it even more. There's the breadth of Christ's love. Really, that comes from Ephesians 2, 12, and 13. But there is the breadth, which in other words, it's another word for width. It is so wide that while it will never condone sin, it welcomes sinners. We don't condone any sin, but we welcome all sinners through the door. And by the way, we got over half a million of them in Albuquerque that we could be welcoming through the doors. Let's just keep welcoming sinners in. Then there's the length of Christ's love. It is so long that it reaches from eternity past to eternity future. It reaches back to when I was this total punk who didn't know Jesus and was living in sin all the way into the eternity that I get to spend with him forever in heaven. That's the length of Christ's love. Then there's the height of Christ's love. It's so high that according to Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6, I'm already seated in the heavenly realms with him even though I'm not there yet. And that's because it's a promise. I can bank on it. Then there's the depth of God's love. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 5 speak all of the depth of Christ's love. It's so deep that Christ came down to earth and he endured a brutal murder. Why? For you and for me. I'm looking at the trade-off going, I get eternity in heaven. 
all of my sin forgiven past, present, and future. No longer do I have to experience sickness, death, decay, disease. Jesus gets to leave his throne in, throne in heaven, get brutally murdered, put on a cross, absorb all the sins of the world and the wrath of the Father. That's the trade-off. That doesn't, and, and we talk about life not being fair. I am a baby sometimes, and I complain about life not being fair. Then I look at what Jesus went through so I could be in heaven with him. And man, am I glad that God is not fair. I'm glad instead that he is just. The second half of verse 19 says this, and it moves us on to our next step in experiencing the full power of Christ. He says, and I want you to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. We need to be filled with all the fullness of God. Let me reiterate that the word filled has had some really bad teaching from multiple different pulpits before. I've heard pastors say, man, some of y'all sitting in this room, you're like a quarter of the way filled with the Holy Spirit. And some of y'all are halfway filled, and some of you are 99% filled, but, but he wants you to be all the way filled. The word filled in the Greek almost every time in the New Testament means to be controlled by there is no 50% or 75%. Either Jesus is the one that's in control of your life or you have decided that you want to take the wheel. But there's no in-between. So Paul says, I want you to be controlled completely by Christ. And when you are, that's when you will see eternal impacts in your life made. And then we move to our final step in verse 20. He says, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power that is at work within us, allow Christ to be the one that is flowing through you. This is not some weird esoteric experience. It's just simply day by day mentally saying, is this Dave or is this Jesus? Is this me and what I'm thinking or is this Jesus? In the way that I'm speaking, is this Jesus or is this me? Listen, we don't want to be the ones that are controlling our thoughts and our speech and our actions. Because to be frankly honest, many of us sitting in this room can be big jerks. So I want Jesus to be the one. Okay, I'm, I'll speak for myself. Most of you are nodding. They're like, yeah, you can be a jerk. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Takes one to know one. So we need to allow the power of Christ really to be flowing through us. And then when all of that takes place, when those five steps that Paul gave us begin to take place, here's what happens. Verse 21, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Did you know that there are churches right now that are in existence today that aren't bringing Jesus glory? Did you know that we could be that church depending on whether or not it's us doing the talking and the thinking and the acting, or whether it's Jesus. It's the church, right? Everything's perfect. We never get on each other's nerves. We don't ever say things to each other that we wish we could take back. We don't ever complain about petty little things, do we? Never. Paul says, yeah, we probably do it fairly often. So let's make sure that Jesus is glorified. And how does that happen? Well, let's wrap this up. This is an extremely long run-on sentence, so if you're an English major, just leave me alone, okay? <laughs> but let me, let me sum this up for you. Here's our conclusion. When the inner man is strengthened, Christ can be at home in your heart, which leads to comprehending and living his love in everyday life, which leads to being filled with the fullness of God or becoming more like him which leads to yielding to the power and control of Christ in our lives, which ultimately results in God being glorified in our lives. There's the summary. There's all five points in a run-on sentence. Praise the Lord. Let me pray for us. Lord Jesus, we come before you and we just ask that you would continue to strengthen our inner self, that, Lord, you would be at home in our hearts with the things that we think and the things that we say and the things that we do. Lord, I pray for myself, I pray for New Covenant Church, I pray for the people of Albuquerque that, Lord, we would come to know at a much deeper level the love that you have for us. Lord, that you would be the one that's fully in control of our lives. That you would be the one 
that speaks through us, that acts through us, that we would be your hands and feet, that we would get out of the way so that it could be you living. Lord, I ask that you would help us to yield to your control and to your power. And Lord, ultimately, we want to see you glorified amongst the nations. Would you be glorified in us as individuals? Would you be glorified in us as families? Would you be glorified in New Covenant Church so that we can in turn go out and bring the good news of Jesus to Albuquerque, to New Mexico, to Lord, a bunch of the Southwest, to our country, and even beyond the borders of our country, that everywhere we go, people would hear and see and come to know Jesus. It's in that mighty name that we all pray together. Amen. Amen. We invite you guys to stand with us. Spirit, lead me. Let's sing this out. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made stronger in the presence of my Savior. Spirit, lead me where my trust is without borders. Let me walk upon the waters wherever you would call me. Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander. And my faith will be made strong. Was a young man at the age of 12 in London, England, who decided he didn't want to live uh, underneath his father's rules anymore. So he took off, and they didn't see him for a decade. 22 years old, he's begging on the streets for dimes and morsels. Walks up to a man in the middle of a rainstorm who's holding an umbrella back to him, and he taps him on the shoulder, and he says, Sir, could you spare a dime so that I could have a morsel? The man turns around, and it's his dad. And dad says, a dime and a morsel, son, come home, and everything is yours. Think about that for a moment. We have got people running around all over the place begging for dimes and morsels so they could try to experience the good life. And yet you and I know the king of kings, we know the heavenly father who says, a dime and a morsel, come to the banqueting table. I welcome you into where you will have a mansion and a feast, not because of who you are, but because of who I am as the king. What an opportunity we have this week. We get to go out and bring Jesus, bring the King to people that are looking for dimes and morsels. Are we ready? Let me pray for us, church body, and then uh, I'll send us out. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. Lord, thank you for the fact that you have brought us into your family. You have brought us to the banqueting table. We no longer have to dumpster dive or beg for dimes or look for morsels, but Lord, you have... Uh, said that you want to give us eternity, that you want to give us eternity free of suffering and sickness and death, uh, free of all of the things that we have to experience this side of heaven because of sin. Lord, we so look forward to being completely freed, but in the meantime, would you 
Help us to bring you to other beggars uh, that need to know the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Lord Jesus, we love you and we praise you. It's in your name that we pray together. Amen. Gang, have a good week, and we'll see you next Sunday.